At first glance, the rise of agriculture seems like a peaceful dawn of human progress. But in recent years, scientific studies have completely upended that view, showing that a prehistoric catastrophe wiped out 95% of all men across Africa, Asia and Europe. So is it true that ancient war reshaped the entire genetic legacy of our species? Hi guys, welcome back. If you're new here, my name is Michael. I have a degree in ancient history and on this channel, we discuss the unexplainable mysteries of our past. Let's get into it. Inside every one of us lies an ancient record, a biological archive written in code. Three billion pairs of molecules silently carrying the story of our species across hundreds of thousands of years. But what if that story includes a chapter of unimaginable horror? Because according to some scientists, hidden in our DNA is evidence that humanity once turned on itself in a way so catastrophic that it nearly erased our species from history. But this didn't happen hundreds of thousands of years ago. No, it was alarmingly recent. The story begins not with archaeology, but with genetics. A few years ago, researchers studying the genomes of modern people made an unsettling discovery. When they looked at the Y chromosome, the one passed from father to son, they noticed something strange. At some point a few thousand years ago, genetic diversity among men suddenly collapsed entire male bloodlines vanished. What they found wasn't subtle. The data pointed to a staggering collapse in male genetic diversity, as if the world's population of men had been almost completely wiped out. Models suggest that up to 95% of males in Africa, Europe and Asia disappeared from the gene pool during this period. It's one of the most dramatic population crashes ever recorded. But when scientists checked mitochondrial DNA, which is passed down from mother to child, the pattern was completely different. The diversity there remained stable. So something had devastated the male population, but left the female population largely untouched. Now, natural disasters don't target only one gender. Volcanic eruptions, plagues, famines, they kill indiscriminately. So this wasn't the work of nature. It was something humans did to each other. But the numbers are staggering. 95% is huge and beyond anything we can even compare. The First and Second World Wars, the bloodiest conflicts in recorded history, don't even scratch that percentage. It would have been the greatest relative slaughter of men our species has likely ever experienced. But this is where the mystery deepens. If our DNA tells us that something like this happened, then shouldn't there be evidence buried somewhere? Bones, battlefields, destruction. Well, there is, and it's been sitting beneath our feet this entire time. When archeologists began piecing together the late Neolithic world, roughly five to 7,000 years ago, they expected to find early farmers and quiet villages, and they did. But they also found bodies, lots of them. Across 180 Neolithic burial sites reviewed in a large survey, more than 1 in 10 individuals showed weapon injuries, evidence that violence was extremely widespread. Studies of their skeletons paint a grim picture. Fractured skulls, arrow wounds, crushed bones. These weren't isolated fights, they were patterns of violence that repeated over generations. Another study from Spain examined 338 skeletons and found that nearly a quarter showed evidence of trauma. But what really stands out is who the victims were, overwhelmingly adult and adolescent males. Roughly 97% of the unhealed injuries belonged to men or teenage boys. Even among those who survived their wounds, over 80% were male. These people weren't just farmers, they were almost soldiers in an endless localized war for land, livestock and survival. And it's important to keep in mind that these are only the injuries that left marks on bone. Many fatal blows wouldn't have. In Neolithic Europe, only about one in three arrow wounds and roughly half of violent injuries are expected to actually mark the bone. So many lethal blows would leave absolutely no trace. So for every cracked skull we find, there may have been many, many more deaths lost to time. Now at first, scientists thought these sites represented small tribal conflicts, but then the scale became impossible to ignore. The dead weren't scattered randomly, they came in clusters. Whole villages wiped out overnight, people killed while fleeing, not fighting. One of the earliest and most infamous examples comes from Talheim in modern day Germany. When excavators opened what looked like a simple pit, they uncovered the remains of 34 people, 
None had been buried with care. Their bodies were twisted, piled, and broken. But what shocked scientists most was the lack of defensive wounds. These weren't warriors who died in battle, they were villagers caught off guard, struck down as they ran. The weapons used were farming tools. The blows were to the head, delivered with precision and force. And when the attackers finished, they left, probably taking the younger women with them. That detail repeats across multiple sites. Because everywhere archaeologists looked, they saw the same eerie pattern. Men slaughtered, younger women missing. Another site in Austria, called Schletz, took the horror even further. Excavated trenches revealed at least 200 victims, all from roughly the same period, around 5000 BC. Once again, there were far more men than women among the dead. But the real nightmare came from the details. Many of the skeletons had been mutilated, arms and legs were missing, skulls were separated from torsos, some remains suggested dismemberment after death, others while possibly still alive. Some researchers believe that the cutting and dismemberment may not have been random cruelty, but ritual, a display meant to terrify other groups into submission. Because across the Neolithic world, different cultures seem to have had different ways of making war. Some cut off heads and kept them as trophies, others broke the legs or shins of their enemies after battle, perhaps to cripple them symbolically in the afterlife. And in some places, newcomers were buried alive, possibly sacrifices or punishments. Whatever their motives, the violence wasn't isolated. It was systemic. It was almost cultural. So it's no wonder then that the average Neolithic lifespan was brutally short. Even discounting infant deaths, many adults didn't live past their early 30s. In terms of mortality, this era ties for the deadliest period in all of human history that we know about. Not because of plagues or predators, but because of other people. But it gets worse, because what comes next at the site of Herxheim in Germany almost defies belief. If you thought the Talheim or Schletz massacres were horrific, then what archaeologists found at Herxheim takes human brutality to another level. At first glance, the site seems like any other Neolithic settlement, but then they found the bones, and there were thousands of them. By the time the excavations were done, archaeologists had uncovered more than 80 enormous pits packed with the remains of over a thousand individuals. The victims ranged from newborns to the elderly, and what the excavators discovered next still defies comprehension. Almost every body had been deliberately dismembered. Skulls were split cleanly in half, long bones shattered, limbs removed and soft tissue stripped away. Some bones were scorched, while others showed clear signs of having been roasted or boiled. The deeper the researchers looked, the more it resembled a production line of death. They realised that the people of Herxheim hadn't been the victims of an attack, they'd been the perpetrators. This was a community that systematically killed and processed human beings, and the victims came from all over Europe. The isotopic analysis showed they came from distant regions, hundreds of kilometres away. But it gets worse. The bones appeared to show human bite marks. Many skulls had been split, likely to access the fatty, nutrient-rich brain inside, and the tongues were often removed. The more the scientists studied the remains, the clearer it became that this wasn't random cannibalism. It was ritualised. The skulls were polished and displayed like trophies. Bone fragments were carved into tools and ornaments. Some skulls were mounted on stakes, marking the entrances to the settlement. It's been suggested that the Herxheim people were perhaps a kind of skull cult, obsessed with death, power and maybe renewal through the consumption of their enemies. But what's even more disturbing is that Herxheim wasn't unique. Across the Neolithic world, we see different cultures expressing violence in different and equally horrifying ways. It's as if almost every society in this era had its own signature method of brutality, almost like a cultural identity defined through blood. And the weapons of this time were as varied as the methods of killing. Farmers turned everyday tools into instruments of war, hammers, sickles, axes and clubs, anything that could crack skulls or cut flesh. But their defences were almost non-existent. There's no trace of real armour, no shields, no metal protection. Fighters probably went into battle wearing nothing more than hides or woven cloth. It was raw, intimate and unimaginably violent. No one was safe, least of all the men expected to defend their homes. Life was short and brutal. Even if you survived the wars, disease and injury were waiting to finish the job. It's almost impossible to comprehend. How did the same species that built temples, invented pottery and learned to farm also descend into a nightmare of perpetual violence? Theories abound, but one stands out. According to many anthropologists, the Neolithic Revolution was both a great achievement and a great curse. 
The theory is that before farming, people lived in small, mobile bands of hunter-gatherers. Life was uncertain, but resources were shared, and conflicts were usually limited. However, once we started settling down and farming, everything changed. Agriculture meant property, land, animals, food. It meant storage, defense, and the first real hierarchies. People had something to fight for, and something to steal. The genetic evidence supports this transformation. As humans formed stable, patrilineal clans, male-dominated king groups, the flow of genes began to change. Women moved between tribes through marriage or capture, keeping their mitochondrial DNA diverse. But men stayed put, fighting and dying within their own lines. And when these clans went to war, they didn't just kill their enemies, they exterminated entire male bloodlines. Each victory erased dozens of Y-chromosome lineages from existence. Over generations, this created the very genetic bottleneck we see today, a world in which almost all surviving Y-chromosomes trace back to a tiny fraction of ancient men who won the wars of prehistory. And that's where scientists make this incredible estimate, that this bottleneck erased up to 90-95% to of all male lineages, a near-extinction-level event for men. It's as if entire continents of fathers vanished, leaving only a few surviving lines to repopulate the world. The Y chromosome collapse wasn't just a genetic anomaly, it was the biological scar of a prehistoric war that nearly wiped us out. Of course, not every scientist agrees that it was all blood and chaos. Some argued that the Y chromosome collapse could have happened more quietly, through peaceful clan splits known as lineal fission. When families grew too large, they broke apart, forming new groups that stayed genetically similar. Over time, some lineages simply faded due to chance, environment, or differences in reproductive success. The result would look the same on a genetic graph, fewer Y lineages surviving even without massive bloodshed. It's also possible that both theories are true, that the bottleneck wasn't caused by one event but by many overlapping pressures, war, environment, and selective survival all interacting over thousands of years. Either way, something extraordinary happened, something that fundamentally reshaped the genetic landscape of humanity, and even today that echo remains. Certain regions never fully regained their pre-bottleneck genetic diversity. Our DNA still carries the scars of that ancient collapse, an invisible reminder that our species nearly tore itself apart. And yet, somehow, we made it through. Over time, the survivors rebuilt, populations rose again, the same social organization that once fueled endless wars also gave rise to cooperation. We learned, painfully, that survival was easier when we traded rather than raided. As networks of exchange and diplomacy grew, large-scale violence began to decline. That's not to say it vanished. Humanity would go on to wage wars far larger than any before. But proportionally, as populations grew, the percentage of people dying from violence plummeted. And if you zoom out across all of recorded human history, the long trend is undeniable. From the Neolithic to now, the world has grown steadily less violent. It's hard to believe, especially when we see conflict in the news every day. But statistically, the average person today is far less likely to die at the hands of another human than at any point in the last 10,000 years. We live in an age of peace that our ancestors couldn't really have imagined. Our lifespans are three times longer, our societies are infinitely more complex, we have law, trade, and diplomacy instead of axes and clubs. The same DNA that once recorded an apocalypse now carries the story of our recovery. But perhaps the most haunting part of all of this is what it says about who we are. Inside every one of us, buried in our genes, is proof of both our capacity for destruction and our ability to rebuild. Our ancestors were capable of staggering brutality, but they were also survivors. The same instincts that once drove them to war later helped them build societies that could sustain peace. Violence may have written the early chapters of our story, but let's hope it doesn't have the final word. Slightly different video today, guys, but I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to leave a comment or a like or subscribe down below, then I'd be really appreciative. I'll see you next time.